It was built in the middle of the 18th century. But the role that this land played in the history of colonial America began more than a hundred years earlier. About two miles from the mansion, out on the old road from Williamsburg to Newport News, there's a state historical marker. Not too many people stopped to read it, but this is what it says. On both sides of this road and extending west was the plantation known as Martin's Hundred, originally of 80,000 acres. Settled in 1619, this hundred, or plantation, sent delegates to the first legislative assembly in America, 1619. In the Indian massacre of 1622, 78 persons were slain here. You can't get much on a marker, and some of the details aren't right, but the story of what happened on that day in March 1622, and in the years on either side of it, is what this film's all about. I'm Ivor Noel Hume, resident archaeologist for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, which owns and exhibits Carter's Grove. When we first came down here looking for the buried remains of its 18th century life, we had no idea what was in store for us. We had begun in 1970 with an archaeological survey of the plantation's more than 500 acres, using machinery to cut exploratory trenches through topsoil disturbed by centuries of agriculture while our crew shaved the surface of the underlying clay in search of soil stains, indicating that holes had once been dug into it. In the process, they began to find potsherds, like these, dating back to the first half of the 17th century. Six years later, we returned to investigate an area previously left untouched, and before long, we realized that we were uncovering the remains of buildings that had nothing to do with Carter's Grove, but everything to do with Martin's Hundred, and perhaps even with its last settlement of Wollstoneholme Town. Like a gripping novel that you can't put down, we couldn't quit at the end of the first year. We had to go on. We'd shot no film during the first months of digging, but thereafter, and for the next three years as it turned out, we committed ourselves to filming whatever happened as it happened. Nothing faked, nothing put back for the camera to find. We were beginning the search for a century about which we knew all too little. And yet here lived people who would have refused to believe that they and their labors would be so soon forgotten. Now faceless and nameless, they had helped the Virginia colony endure. Until we began, we had no idea that at least 23 of them lived and died in this field at Carter's Grove. It was a far cry from the tall spires and the busy city streets and docks of London where their odyssey began. It was there, in 1606, that the Virginia Company of London boarded 104 colonists onto three ships. Ships which arrived off the coast of Virginia on April the 26th, 1607. 18 days later, it disembarked the passengers to take their first giant step that led to the founding of the United States. They'd chosen one of the least desirable bits of real estate along the James River, and that bad beginning was but the first of several mistakes and disasters that beset the colony during its first 10 years. Nothing has been found of the original palisaded Jamestown settlement, but many people, including me, believe that it stood near here, though much, if not all of it, may have been eroded by the river. This famous landmark, Jamestown's church tower, was built at least 30 years later. It was the fact that no archaeological traces of Jamestown's earliest palisades and buildings have yet been found that was to make our discoveries so valuable. In 1616, to raise more money and to encourage other investors to send out settlers, the Virginia Company decided to offer land patents to secondary companies, and one of them called itself the Martins Hundred Society. By April 1619, a ship called the Gift of God had brought 220 emigrants to settle a 20,000-acre tract of land about seven miles downriver from Jamestown Island. Somewhere in the middle of a 10-mile river frontage on land that later became Carter's Grove Plantation, they established their core settlement and named it Wollstoneholme Town in honor of a principal shareholder, Sir John Wollstoneholme, just as the entire enterprise was named after another London shareholder, Richard Martin. Our preliminary survey had revealed a ring of 17th century occupation around the site of the later colonial mansion. 
but which, if any of these red dots mark the location of Woolston hometown, we could only guess. The first site to be explored was this one. And here are the clues to what happened there, thousands of them. But, like words in a dictionary, they only become eloquent if arranged in the right order, and if we can read their language. Archaeologists are trained to recognize fragments like these as being part of a stoneware bottle manufactured in the German Rhineland in about 1620. And which, when it was intact, looked like this. Of course, by itself, it's just a ceramic bottle, a museum specimen to be admired for its own sake. But to understand the role it once played, we need to see it in an original setting. And we can get tantalizingly close to doing that by means of 17th century paintings like this by the Flemish artist Adrian van Ostade. artifact suddenly comes alive. It becomes the key to open a door, and beyond it we find faces, faces surprisingly like our own. Like the lepidopterist who impales butterflies into a posture of perpetual beauty, the Dutch and Flemish artists of the 17th century attempted to arrest life as they chose to see it, life which closely paralleled that of neighboring England. The poses may be stiff, but the trappings are real enough like the silver threads in the clothing of the servant, and the gold in those of his wealthy master. And here are such silver threads from our first sight at Martin's Hundred. Cotton thin strands of drawn silver of the kind once so popular in brocading and embroidering clothing. And here's the gold, woven from much finer threads than the silver and twisted at the end to a point. It's the end of a lace, which in fact was called a point. They were often worn as garter decoration, like these so carefully shown on Daniel Mighton's portrait of Sir Henry Peyton. And this is how Virginia's leaders must have looked as they boarded their ships at Deptford or Portsmouth. How they looked when they stepped ashore after three months in a small ship with 200 or more passengers of lower estate, many of whom died on the way, may have been a very different story. In 1621, the same year that these pictures were painted, the assembly at Jamestown imposed a regulation designed to suppress drunkenness, gaming, and excess in clothes, ruling that no one but the council and the heads of hundreds were to wear gold in their clothes. So who did these threads belong to? In 1620, the Martins Hundred Society sent over its own governor, William Harwood of Barnstable in Devonshire. And as soon as he arrived, he was appointed to the governor's council. So here was a man who was both a council member and the head of a hundred or plantation. So perhaps we'd found traces of William Harwood's own clothing. And there was another clue that pointed to that. In the Virginia census of 1625, recording the colony's military capability, William Harwood was the only person who owned a cannon. And in one of the pits on this same site, we found a cannonball. Not positive proof by any means, but certainly a forceful clue and more substantial than most of our evidence for the appearance of the settlers' homes. On this, our first site, in addition to the cemetery area, we found several fence lines leading to a group of nine structures representing the evolutionary steps in the development of a small plantation or farming community. The largest of the buildings was a dwelling measuring 40 feet by 18, with a lean-to addition at one side. By early colonial standards, that was a pretty big house. But all it left behind was a series of back-filled holes in the ground in which hosts had been seated. Unlike modern homes which have a solid, continuous foundation, these early Virginia houses were usually built with wooden framing whose main posts were set in the earth. 
That meant that the life expectancy for one of these house foundations was unlikely to be more than 10 or 12 years. There's a lot more to a post hole than one might think. And once you grasp what it has to say, you also understand the basic principles of archaeological reasoning. Now it's weighted down, this is a good, clear example. What you're seeing is a hole within a hole, both of them fill. This inner one is a ghost image of the post, what we call the post mole. As the post decayed, the wood was replaced by silt. So that was the end of the story. Now out here we've got the beginning. The outline of the hole dug when the post was installed and the dirt backfilled around it. Let's take a look at a cross section through that. It'll go something like this. Here's the hole. And this is the post. Now we fill up the space around it and accidentally drop a 1967 quarter into it, right here. That will tell a future archaeologist that the post wasn't installed before 1967. A few years later, our post catches fire and gets reduced to ashes. Along comes the cleanup squad and loses a dime into the loose top of the post mold. And that turns out to be a 1975 dime. So it's telling us that the post burned no earlier than 1975. As you've seen, our holes were making patterns which gave us the dimensions of buildings. But what did those buildings look like? We don't have much to go on. Our most graphic sources of evidence, therefore, are the surviving paintings of now vanished buildings, like this post-built house and its dilapidated barns painted by Vincent van Gogh. This is probably the best rendering of our kind of farm buildings we're likely to find. Here now, we see a mid-17th century painting of a similar farm in somewhat better condition. This one by the Flemish artist Jan Siebrecht. It's a picture alive with people and action. Here is the kind of peasant architecture that was common in Flanders and Holland well into the 19th century. It's by no means an elegant house. At one end seems to be a stable. But it has a well-built chimney and glass in its windows. And we have that from at least one of our houses. Broken panes of window glass and the lead that held it in position. How common was window glass in Virginia in the second quarter of the 17th century? We really don't know. Clearly, in Europe, it was not necessarily evidence of high living. But what about this? Part of a Delftware pottery wall or fireplace tile. It was decorated in the center with a single standing figure and at the corners with scroll designs. Just like these in a painting by Peter de Ho, a Dutch interior of about 1660. Although the woman is shown peeling apples, this is no peasant's kitchen, but rather the home of a relatively well-to-do and certainly well-dressed family. Which brings us back to the gold and silver threads. The clues are telling us that in spite of the none too permanent foundations, the site was home to people of some consequence. People whose homes were probably looking a good deal better on the inside than they did on the out. And the uh, documents give some support to that. And so too do the artifacts. This is part of a pair of iron fireplace tongs. This was a quality tool that would have sat comfortably alongside a fireplace lined with Delftware tiles. In the 17th century, Dutch and Flemish artists painted countless pictures of contemporary peasant life. And where there were peasants, there invariably were pots. Reminders, too, of what those pots meant to the people who owned and used them. This vessel, called a pipkin, is a strikingly close parallel for the pot on Jan Steen's frugal meal table. His, of course, was Dutch. But this was made by one of our Martin's hundred colonists, and when we realized that fact, we knew that we had stumbled into another hitherto unopened closet of Virginia history. Somewhere in the hundred, there had lived a potter capable of turning out wares of shapes almost identical to their European counterparts. Of course, it's easy enough for me to tell you that our pot was made in Virginia, but how do we prove that? Well, our first clue came when we were excavating one of our rubbish-filled pits beside the post-built house. In it, we found this weird pottery object, which looks like a bit of space-age hardware. And I have to admit that when we began to uncover it, I hadn't the first idea what it was. It turned out to be the top element of a three-part distilling apparatus. It was scientifically known as an alembic. It was often called a helm, because it looks rather like a Turkish-style military helmet. Whatever you were distilling was heated in a bowl below, and then the uh, 
steam condensed on the inside of the glazed helm and then ran down into this channel which runs around here and out through that spout. And that's the only piece missing from this really marvelous object. Intact, it looked pretty much like that one in a mid 16th century picture by Peter Bruegel. But his has a simple round knob at the top. And that's the way they are on most of the fragmentary examples dug up in Europe. But ours is a noble pinnacle, grandly thrusting to a point on which the obviously proud potter has dabbed a crowning and totally unnecessary blob of green glaze. But to my mind, this is one of the most accomplished pieces of earthenware potting surviving from the 17th century. And I'm convinced that it was actually made in Martin's Hundred. On the rim, there's a scar where the vessel has stood on a prop in the kiln. Now, this roofing tile fragment has been used as just such a prop. And where the glaze has run down from the pot that stood on it, there's a matching scar. And this was found in the same pit as the Alembic. As nobody would take a piece of kiln waste very far from the factory, the site of it had to be close by. But in which direction? Our excavations and the earlier trenching had yielded no traces to north, west, or south. So all that's left are the woods to the east, 150 acres of them, in which to hide the remains of a kiln covering an area of no more than eight or 10 feet. Where would you start looking for a pottery kiln? Or for the lost town of Wollstonehome, for that matter? It's tempting to suggest that the buildings we've already found were part of the town. But the facts don't fit. Wollstonehome was in existence by 1620, and we found nothing we can safely date that early. We know, too, that Martin's Hundred was one of the worst hit areas in the great Indian massacre of March the 22nd, 1622. In February 1624, there were only 24 people living in the whole 31 square mile tract. That's just one more person than we found buried in the graves on our site. We need to know how these people fitted into the broad picture of life and death in Martin's Hundred. We need to find the town of Wollstonehome. We need to find the pottery kiln site. Now, logic dictates that uh, there have to be more sites buried somewhere in these woods. The only way to find the early sites is to dig for them. And even then, you need an awful lot of luck. You dig rows of small test holes, looking in the soil for a few chips of brick, a potsherd, a nail, an oyster shell, anything that will say somebody did something here. And here it is, brick dust. So far, there's nothing to tell us when this brick was buried. There are no other artifacts at all. But over here, it's a different story. Here, fragments of pottery have been found in the test holes, and some of the pieces were made by Arcada's Grove potter. This may be the place where our answers are buried. Move a bit to the left. That's good. Hold it steady. Well, the last of the underbrush has been cleared. The survey stakes are in. The grid lines are laid out. And we're ready to dig. And what we'll find, and what you will see, is anybody's guess. It's tempting to start by digging right in the center of the site where the test holes have been most productive. But if you do that, you rip the heart out of the animal and then are left wondering why it isn't breathing. So we begin at the edges and work in. But even there, we're finding pieces of pottery, some of it looking as though it's locally made. Right from the start, an astonishing number of artifacts began to flow into the laboratory some of them hinting at the 17th century presence of someone of relative wealth. Here are table knives decorated with intricately applied silver and gold, yet taken for granted, because I doubt whether their owner ever looked at them as closely as we see them now. And there was a brass buckle from a sword belt. The common sorts were of iron. And part of a spur, again of brass, but this time washed with gold. Of more immediate concern is a tremendous number of fragments of the local earthenware we're finding. Many of the sherds are very small and offer little hope of their being put back together into restorable pots, although that is possible for a few. But the majority seem to come from a great many vessels and included pieces that range from gross overbaking in the kiln to others so underfired as to be almost useless. I was beginning to wonder whether I was putting too much store by my alleged ability to recognize Virginia pots made from Virginia clays. There was only one way to find out. We had to be able to prove that this clay contained uh, 
chemical elements or minerals either not to be found in English and European wares or they're in different ratios. I took the problem to Dr. Stephen Clement, chairman of the Department of Geology at the College of William and Mary, who agreed to accept a series of Virginia and European fragments for spectrographic analysis. Initially, I ran all the samples with no idea of what to expect or how they would vary or if they would vary. The chemical elements in the samples are the same. The differences only became apparent when I began to examine the data and found that there seemed to be a significant variation in one pair of elements, titanium and potassium. When we analyzed the local clay, we found that it too had a high titanium to potassium ratio and thus the high titanium samples are attributed to local origin. The analyses seem to bear out the field observations. Well, we're now five weeks into the excavation. Seven men have scraped and brushed and dug for 1,400 man hours. And what have we got? Well, what we've got is problems. An awful lot of dirt has been examined and shifted, and you can see we've opened a sizable area. There are artifacts scattered all through the soil, but so far we haven't a clue what they're doing here. We've yet to find the slenderest trace of a building, and there are no signs of a trash pit, and yet the artifacts, as I say, are everywhere. Most of them are pretty much the same as those we've found on our first site. There's one thing we're finding here which we didn't get there, and that's uh, pottery like this. Bits of these yellow glazed decorated dishes are found scattered all over the site. Now, they weren't made here. They come from a factory on the north coast of Devonshire in England, in Barnstable or Biddeford. The thing is that there are no fragments of these from the other site, and yet both sites are apparently occupied at the same time. So why do we have the dishes here and not there? And there's another problem. The artifacts are telling us that people lived here, but the only evidence we have of their food is limited to two fragments of bone and eight oyster shells. Not even dinner for one. Meanwhile, in the lab, Audrey Noel Hume was checking our artifacts distribution. As we studied the charts, it became very clear very quickly that most of the artifacts were concentrated in soil levels east of the ditch that runs across the site. Here's the chart showing the distribution of the Delftware. The local scafito and slipware spreads a bit different. Here's the nail distribution, and this is the chart for the tobacco pipe fragments. The pipes were also saying that the date range of the site may be earlier than we thought. The pipes are dated partly on the evidence of the size and shape of their bowls, which got bigger as tobacco became cheaper, but also by measuring the diameters of the holes through the stems, which, as the years went by, were made smaller to fit within stems being made ever longer and thinner. The mathematics go like this. Having taken the number of stem fragments from our first and second layers, and after arriving at a mean hole diameter, we multiply it by 38.26, subtract the result from 1931.85, and supposedly you're left with a median date. In this case, 1618.37. Extending the excavation northward was the obvious next step, and the possibility that the site may date earlier than the Indian massacre of 1622 was tremendously exciting, as were the evocative artifacts which began to appear as the soil layers were peeled away. This Indian projectile point is of a type common 3,000 years ago, while that fine stone axe is of a shape used in the more recent woodland period. But they're both from the top of a colonial rubbish pit, the first one we found on the site, and it's full of artifacts. I think one of the big questions that everybody's asking right now is whether we're looking at uh, relics of the massacre. Uh, it was, of course, one of the great and dramatic moments in the whole of Virginia history. And yet, up to this point, no archaeologist has ever found a trace of that 1622 attack on a colonial home site. Some archaeologists will tell you that they feel no sense of personal involvement, and they don't care if they find an intact object or just one fragment. Well, I do. You see the piece of blue stoneware? 
Well, that comes from a jug made in the German Rhineland. And it was a splendid thing, a marvellous object. And I don't mind admitting I'll be as excited as a kid at Christmas if we can find the rest of it. Here's an elbow section from a suit of armour. The last time one of these was found was during the Civil War, when the Confederates were building a fort at Jamestown. But this is in much better condition. I may be wrong, but that pipe bowl doesn't look as early as the Indian massacre. But this Delftware dish could be. The condition of some of these things is really quite astonishing. Blocks like this usually come out as nothing but lumps of rust, which threaten to fall apart as you touch them. The table knife has lost its point, but the rest of the blade's in fine shape. It isn't very often that an archaeologist gets the answers to his problems handed to him on a plate, but that's what's happened here. Of course, we were looking for the Indian massacre of 1622, but the plate says, sorry, you're in 1631 or later. Made from our local Virginia clay, this dish is the earliest dated piece of American pottery on record. The yellow stripe down the side of the design spoiled the plate before it was broken. And I'm pretty sure that discoloring happened in the kiln. We found fragments from two more of these bird decorated dishes and one of them has the same glazing failure. So they may all be rejects from that still elusive kiln. Now here's our German jug. We didn't find it all, but it's still a fine object. Because today unbroken examples command high prices, we tend to think that this was always so, and that can be dangerous. It tricks us into interpreting a higher standard of living than really was the case. It's the contemporary Dutch and Flemish paintings that help us keep our perspective. Here, just such a jug stands beside a window ledge above a woman scraping parsnips in a painting by Nicholas Maas in 1655. Here, in rather more elegant hands, is a virtually identical jug, again in a picture by Nicholas Mass, but painted a year later. This object, our elbow from a suit of armour, also hints at a household owning relatively elaborate and costly possessions. Most of Virginia's early settlers may do with mere cuirasses, that's uh, plates for the back and the chest, but not the arms. This elbow cop, or cooter as it's more correctly termed, was worn on a more complete suit, though probably less well-made than this one painted by Van Dyck and being worn by Charles II as an 11-year-old boy. But the cooter goes right there. The armour from Site B wasn't limited to plate armour. We've also found these small iron strips, which come from a canvas jacket protected inside with overlapping scales. It was called a brigandine. Now, this one is probably Italian, but you can see how the scales are applied, each one riveted to the fabric. Jackets like these were lighter than plate armour, but so was mail, and we found several small pieces of it in the same pit as the elbow. They probably came from a shirt or coat like this, which weighs about 14 pounds, lighter than a half suit of plate armour and a good deal more flexible. All in all, the people on Site B seem to have been well prepared to defend themselves. Artefacts like this sword guard are exciting to find. Some of them are attractive to look at, and in the long run, they're the visual legacy of all the archaeologists' hard work. But artefacts are meaningless unless we know why they were here and where they came from. If you're thinking that archaeology involves a lot of work to get very little, well, you're right. Much of the time is spent in housekeeping, cleaning up for photography, getting rid of fallen leaves, loose dirt, modern footprints. But now, at last, we're finding post holes for a building and the jigsaw puzzle's beginning to fit together. Thanks to a persistent and dedicated crew, we found what we were hunting for. The full ground plan of the building where our artifacts came from. It's not much to look at, just two rows of post holes but they form a rectangle measuring 36 feet by 19, making the building just a little smaller than the dwelling on our first site. That measured 40 by 18 feet, which in the 17th century was quite a big house. <laughs> 
There's a 1621 record that a house was to be provided here in Martin's Hundred for a newly arrived servant. That was to measure 14 feet by only 12, which was about a quarter of the size of this building. Finding the house was crucial, otherwise all the artifacts would have told us nothing. But those artifacts have been like the sirens luring Odysseus to disaster. They've drawn us further and further from the house site, and now they've vanished. To the north, there's virtually nothing. Test trenches extended out to the east are coming up dry every time, and there's no indication there was any appreciable erosion in that direction. If the colonists threw most of their garbage into the ravine, you'd expect that some of it would hang up on the edge, but there's nothing here. And we're faring no better at the bottom, where all the larger artifacts should have fallen. Not a sign of anything, except water. Still searching for Wollstone hometown, we move to this area closer to the river. It was another of those early sites located but unexplored during the first archaeological survey. Renewed testing showed that the ground had been ploughed for centuries, that would have nothing to tell us until the plough zone was stripped off. Then, once again, it was time for the back-breaking task of hunting for post holes. For weeks, the temperature on the site topped 100 degrees. It wasn't much fun, and what we were finding made little sense. Colonial soil disturbances were confined to one corner of the area we'd opened up, all enclosed within two rows of post holes, some kind of fence with posts set nine feet apart. We decided to ignore those for the time being and to concentrate on a large patch of dark soil about 30 feet in diameter and a pit to the east of it. Both of them rich in artifacts that could help us establish an approximate date for what we were finding. Here was the same west of England where we'd found in the woods on site B. Some of the tobacco pipes had the same marks as examples from our first site. So there seemed to be connections between all three sites. What made this one different was the presence of many weapon parts, including the firing mechanisms for no fewer than five matchlock muskets. Our Governor Harwood had 25 spare match cocks. They came from guns like this, the simplest form of musket. It operated with a lever instead of a trigger, and rather than having a flint like the later guns, it was, uh, its powder was fired by using this burning fuse, which was forced forward into this little pan, which you had to open by hand. The problem with these guns, well, one of the problems, is that they're extremely heavy. So heavy, in fact, that you had to prop them up on a stand like that. There were 18 steps to loading one of these things, and 14 more for firing it. And if you're lucky, and the thing went off, it had an accurate range of about 30 yards. Not all the artifacts were military in nature. There was a good deal of pottery, a butcher's cleaver, a stirrup, a shackle for securing cattle or prisoners, and two telltale fragments from a cast iron plate used to protect the back of a domestic fireplace. One like this reproduction decorated with the arms of Britain's King James I, the shield circled by the motto of the Order of the Garter, Oni soit qui mal y pense, evil be to him who evil thinks. And our pieces fit right here. You'd expect such a plate to come from the home of somebody important. But on the site, our post hole patterns weren't looking at all domestic. It was our research historian who provided the explanation, reminding us that in contemporary descriptions, Jamestown's fort was said to have been triangular and built with a palisado of planks and strong posts with a bulwark or watchtower at each corner. It was all here the lines of the palisade walls meeting, and four major post holes marking the corners of the watchtower. In the silt of this shallow well, we first found this almost complete armor backplate. But the real prize was this, the first complete face covering helmet ever found in the new world. Raised from the well, still bedded in silt and reinforced with rubber and plaster of Paris within a steel casing, the helmet's excavation was completed in the safety of the laboratory, where fragile details, like the prop that held the visor up and the collar's brass-capped rivets, could be carefully revealed. This was a stunning discovery. Known as a close helmet because it closed over the wearer's face, it was a last echo of the traditions of medieval combat. 
Unfortunately, time and a fluctuating water level had transformed the iron into a film of rust, about as sturdy as wet cardboard, concealed under a layer of rust-bonded clay, which conservator Gary McQuillan slowly pared away using a tool called an air abrasive jet. Propelled by a hundred pounds of air pressure, it bombards the clay and rust with powdered aluminum oxide, pellets 50 microns in diameter, about the size and consistency of household flour. But soft though the pellets are, under that pressure, they'll cut iron. One miscalculation, and you've done irreparable damage. As the metal decayed in the well, the weight of silt over the helm caused it to be crushed out of shape. Cracked and broken pieces of the visor had to be removed and be reset, leading, in the end, to an object that must truly rank among the treasures of American archaeology. It's the embodiment of the concept of European power made obsolete by the mobile and elusive Indian, unacquainted with the rules of civilized warfare. Back in the field, conclusions were harder to come by. We'd found only one corner of the fort and traced one wall about 30 feet and the other for about 80. If we were to make any educated guesses as to the shape of the enclosure, we needed to find at least one more corner. So, on the last day of the dig, we stripped away the plough zone in a broad trench following the north wall line, hunting all the time for a corner and another watchtower to match the one we'd already found. We found the corner all right, but it didn't match the first. That had described an angle of about 70 degrees. This one was 90 degrees, and there was no matching watchtower. We're now eight months older, but not a great deal wiser. The questions we were asking in September still plague us in May. How big was the fort? Was it triangular? When was it built? When destroyed? Did Governor Harwood's house stand inside it? And was the fort part of Wollstone home town? We reasoned that if indeed the fort was part of the town, it must have been at the back of it. So I decided to begin this year's excavations close to the river's edge and to work inland towards the fort. In that way, we could sneak up on it from the outside. And we'd have a chance to see whether there are other buildings between it and the river. Well, there are. This is what's happened. Slightly to the east of the fort and stretching in an oval between it and the river, we're finding another palisaded enclosure. And inside it, at least two buildings. One here, measuring 25 feet by 15, and this one over here, much longer, measuring 60 feet by 15. Ashes in the post mold, and in two instances the charred ends of the posts themselves, leave no doubt that the buildings were destroyed by fire. At the west end of the longhouse, we're finding no evidence of slots for wooden sills, suggesting that this element of the building was different in character. It reminds me of Jan Sibirek's farm painting, which showed a stable or byre at one end of the house, the doors closing on a central post, just as we have here. More support for the stable or cattle shed interpretation is provided by the post holes for a palisade isolating that end from the rest of the house and also enclosing the second smaller building. 63 feet towards the river, there's another fenced area, this one much smaller, with a 20 by 15 foot house in one corner, again constructed on posts, but the pattern distinct enough to show where the doors were, where the chimney had been, and to identify a shed roof extending out from the building on the north side. One of the archaeologists' most difficult tasks is to convert these post holes and the shattered artifact into a reconstruction of images that now exist only in our heads. We are extremely fortunate in having artist Richard Schlecht to help us make that transition. Dick specializes in 17th and 18th century archaeological interpretation, and he's been working with us on and off for several months, studying the Dutch and Flemish paintings, pouring over our post holes and listening to our interminable debates on the meaning of what we're finding. Not only does Dick give the public a chance to share our conclusions and to see the past as we think we see it,
but he also forces us to address ourselves to every detail and where possible to document everything he draws, everything from Indian hairstyles on the shape of a European stool to whether shutters would have opened in or out and how the frame of a wheelbarrow was built. It's just eight feet from that doorway that we're finding this six foot long soil stain, which looks to me like a grave, even though it's got a lot of ashes and a few artifacts sticking out of it. If the hole does contain a skeleton and we can find evidence of violent death and hasty burial, there's a good chance that the buildings around it burned at the time of the 1622 massacre. Of course, to support that conclusion, we have to be very sure that none of the artifacts coming out of the hole date any later than 1622. And we have to find bones. Several broken tobacco pipes were in the fill over the skeleton, and so far they all readily fit within the first 30 years of the 17th century. No problem here. Dr. Lawrence Angel, curator of physical anthropology for the Smithsonian Institution, interprets the bones as those of a white male between 30 and 40 years old, about five foot nine in height, and suffering from some arthritic fusion of the lower vertebrae. The man also had a couple of bad teeth that must have made him pretty short-tempered. But how did he die? In the ground, it looked as though our man had been killed by a heavy blow to the right side of his head. But now that we have the skull in the laboratory, where it can be excavated under more closely controlled conditions, we're seeing other damage. Another blow to the back of the head has thrust small fragments inward with such force that they're stacked like poker chips inside it. This is our only 17th century illustration of the massacre. Drawn by Théodore de Bray, it purports to show the slaughter at Jamestown, but it wasn't published until 1634, and there was no massacre at Jamestown, because the colonists there were warned the night before, and when the Indians found them ready, they backed off. Martin's Hundred was not so lucky, and the reported death toll there was the highest in the colony. Fortunately, we have a lengthy description of what happened a narrative put together three or four months afterwards from the testimony of survivors. Basing his interpretation of the massacre on it and on our archaeological evidence, Dick Schlecht's reconstruction is infinitely more accurate than Debray's. Here's part of what that contemporary account tells us. As in other days before, they came unarmed into our houses with deer, turkeys, fish, furs, and other provisions to sell, Yea, in some places, sat down at breakfast with our people at their tables, whom immediately, with their own tools and weapons, they basely and barbarously murdered, not sparing either age or sex, man, woman, or child, so sudden in their cruel execution that few or none discern the weapon or blow that brought them to destruction. Now this tool, a spade blade, was found near the grave and it neatly fits a gash in the brow of our supposed massacre victim's skull, a gash which we did not see until the skull was restored. Both Dr. Angel and Virginia State Medical Examiners are satisfied that this was the felling blow and that the others were struck afterwards. But that's not all our man suffered. We think that this narrow groove along the left brow is the result of scalping. We know from the documents that not only did the Virginia Indians remove hair locks, they actually stripped the flesh from the faces of still living victims. Now, it's possible, you know, that the report sent back to London describing what happened in that massacre of 1622 were actually absolutely precise when they wrote that the Indians returned, making as well as they could a fresh murder, defacing, dragging, and mangling the dead. You may be thinking that for the archaeologist, death holds a morbid fascination. But that's really not true at all. The bones and the artifacts are pieces of life. They help us reach out to the people. It's the things that they did that matter, not the things they left behind. In short, our goal is to put flesh on the bones. In the case of our massacre victim, we are taking that almost literally. This is a cast of his skull, made exactly to the millimeter. We've had it made to take advantage of a novel restoration technique developed for a quite different profession, that of forensic anthropology, or more simply, homicide investigation. The recognized pioneer in this new dimension to medical illustration is Betty Pat Gatliffe. 
we use different tissue depth information for the male or female skull. I cut rubber tissue markers, the length as given in a scale on 18 different points of the skull, and I glue those tissue markers directly on the skull, and then it's a matter of stripping from one point to the other, sort of connect the dots, if you will. We taper the clay from one depth to the other to give the face a frame-like appearance, and then we fill in those spaces and start adding the features. All of the features are determined from the bony structure of the skull. We were fortunate to have nearly all of the teeth in the skull because the teeth are important in shaping the mouth barrel. It gives the shape to the mouth. I believe the cranial architecture forms the face. I'm sure there are some things about it that are very accurate. This skull has some very unusual things about it, especially the mandible being flared as it is, makes the jaw very wide, and he undoubtedly had heavy muscles in his cheeks. He had a prominent chin. I believe the cranial architecture definitely forms the face, the shape of the face, and the features are all determined from the skull itself. There really is not as much guesswork as you might expect but the, I just do what the skull tells me to do and try not to do any more. So here, as Betty Gatliff says, we have the face of our man skillfully reconstructed on the basis of a series of average tissue measurements. But whenever we turn people into numbers and back again, we invariably lose something, and what we lose is life. To some extent, at least, the kind of life we live is etched in our faces. The man who works the land or sails a ship uh, has the legacy of that in his shaving mirror. That's always supposing he shaves. Our man was almost certainly bearded, but whether it was the tight, pointed, carefully trimmed beard of the courtier, or whether he just scissored it now and then to cut out the knots, we'll never know. We won't even know the color of his hair or of his eyes. We don't know whether his face was pitted by smallpox or puffy from drink or emaciated by starvation and dysentery. The skull can't tell us that, nor can tissue measurements. But with those reservations aside, it's possible that his mother or his murderer would recognize this face. We were to find 14 more graves, all of them within a few feet of the small domestic unit. But whether they contained victims of massacre or disease is impossible to say. These bones were all in extremely poor condition, and in some cases had completely rotted away. But one thing is certain. Life and death here in Martin's Hundred were never far apart. Ten feet from our massacre victim's grave, we've got another pond-like depression, very much like the one in the fort. At the bottom, and thrown into the accumulating silt, we are finding a remarkable array of artifacts. Some imported, like this Delftware pharmacist's jar. But most of the pottery was made right here on the site, including examples of pots that split, warped, and got too hot in the kiln. But then not all the artifacts were relics of the potter. We found two musket barrels, part of a sword, the remains of another armor backplate, and, to our astonishment, another close helmet, very similar to the one from the fort well. So now we have not only the first, but the second complete close helmet to be found in the new world. And we have another even more significant first, the oldest complete ground plan for a timber fort yet uncovered in British America. It wasn't triangular, it was trapezoidal, no two sides or angles alike, a structure laid out by someone trained in the uh, why don't we stop about here school of military engineering. In addition to its watchtower, the fort had a single gun platform, right here, for a cannon pointing down river and aiming between our company compound and the domestic unit. Dick Schlecht's drawing, based on what we found in the ground and contemporary documentary descriptions of palisades both in America and Ireland, gives us a pretty good impression of what the fort's construction must have looked like from the inside. As for the gun, we're basing its size and caliber 
on the evidence of that cannonball we found in our first site, and which we're still associating with Governor Harwood or his successor. It was a large fort, not nearly as big as the one at Jamestown, which had the whole settlement inside it, but bigger than most of the forts built to protect British communities of the same period in Northern Ireland. And it was to Ireland that we turned for our interpretation of what we're finding here in Virginia. Several plans and drawings of British colonial settlements in Northern Ireland survive in the library of Lambeth Palace in London. Here are two such villages, shown side by side and drawn around 1620, the same time that our Wollstone home town was developing. These Irish plans, and others like them, reveal a standardization of layout, a wide street or green flanked by the houses of tenants and freeholders, and at one end, the fort, wherein lived the settlement leader. This is the way the proposed Irish village of McCoskin was drawn by its sponsors in London. Here's the village green, and the wide street, with the house lots laid out on either side. And here's the fort, they called it a bourne, at one end of the street. And you can see that although its gate is off centre in the wall, it's still positioned on the centre line of the street. And here's what we found so far. It suddenly dawned on me that the two are remarkably similar. This is where we believe our fort gate to have been, approximately 150 feet from those fences and buildings. So if planners in London provided the same colonizing kits to settlers going to Virginia as they did to Ireland, it's reasonable to argue that both were instructed to design and defend their settlements in the same way. So if our Anglo-Irish connection is valid, we should find more construction on the other side of our village, 150 feet in this direction. And there is our building, 150 feet north of the fort gate, the largest single structure we've found on any of our Martins 100 sites, 45 feet long and 29 feet wide. We think it may be the Martins 100 Society's produce warehouse. What makes this discovery so important is that the building is not parallel to those on the other side of the avenue or village green. In fact, neither side is at right angles to the fort. Instead, each side comes off at an angles of 83 degrees. Now, if we project those lines out to the uh, cliff edge and beyond, uh, we can deduce that the Wollstone Home Settlement was only big enough to house a handful, uh, maybe the administrative handful, of Martin's hundreds, more than 200 original settlers. Our building lines would come sufficiently close together to mark the riverside end of the town at a point that's now about 350 to 400 feet out in the water. Where David Hazard and his team of divers are trenching in the river bed for traces of timber revetments along the eroded 1619 shoreline. They haven't found them. But the restricted distribution of these fossil shells suggests that beds of marl under the clay were once interrupted by ravines that caused the Wollstoneholm site to taper toward the river thus explaining why our town plan does not have parallel sides, like its Irish counterparts. There is still much that we do not know about Wollstoneholm town, but this is certain. On that bluff, overlooking the James River, stood one of Britain's earliest attempts to establish new towns in a new world. Having only the post-hole patterns to define its plan, we can never hope to reconstruct the fort or its adjacent compounds and buildings. But thanks to the skills of our artist friend Dick Schlecht, we're permitted glimpses of them through his eyes. Wagons flounder in the mud. Citizen soldiers drill on the green. Workmen add new fences. Builders construct new buildings. And women carry their buckets to the nearby spring for water. Beyond the trees, we found another site, another part of Wollstone home town, one we call the suburb. Here was another palisaded compound around a home that apparently came to a fiery end in the massacre of 1622. Three women died here, one of them under circumstances so strange that I can't resist reaching beyond the facts into the treacherous currents of conjecture. She lies on her side, not in a grave, but in a partly filled rubbish pit, and in a posture of repose, her right hand up to her head and her left arm across her chest, the fingers folded under as they often are when we sleep. It's a posture consistent with death by exposure. We called her Granny because she'd lost her lower molars, though in reality she was only 35 or 40 years old. Around her head, we found a thin iron band, apparently bent back around the nape of her neck. You can see it best in this X-ray view of the skull. 
We think the band is the remains of a metal and fabric frame over which well-to-do women in late Elizabethan times rolled their hair. In its most elaborate form, the frame would have looked something like this. So Granny had had time to do her hair in her old-fashioned way on the morning of the day she died. She clearly was a person who tried to keep up appearances on the frontier of European civilization. It was strange, therefore, that we found no traces of clothing on the body, no gold or silver threads, no iron hooks, no buttons. These were found inside the compound, where they'd been scattered on the ground surface near the house. A costume expert at London's Victoria and Albert Museum has said that they come from a woman's dress. Did they perhaps mark the place where Granny was attacked by the Indians? Indians who tore her hair roll back over her head as they attempted to take her scalp. Left for dead and amid the confusion, she escaped through this gate, intending to take shelter in the adjacent ravine. Instead, she got no further than the pit, where she hid and later died from exposure or loss of blood. Looking at her as she lay in the ground, we couldn't help wondering what her last thoughts may have been. Memories, perhaps, of her youth in Shakespeare's England. As the flames erupted and the smoke drifted and her friends lay dead at their doors, Granny surely must have believed that the great Virginia adventure was over. She couldn't know that survivors would return and that bigger and better farms leading to the great plantations of the 18th century would grow out of the ashes of what had happened on that fatal Friday morning in March 1622.